Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. With or without help, sooner or later the lie will be revealed. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Thank you, he said sincerely. You have no idea how much I missed good coffee. After a few minutes, he raised his head and looked at Gina with a grin. Okay, Nurse Esposito, I guess I owe you a little cooperation. So what's on the agenda today? Word association? Rat tests? Block puzzles? Gina rolled her eyes, but she had a plan, so she ignored his teasing. After much thought, she decided to start by examining Ben's memories of what happened just before his episode. She was interested in knowing in great detail everything that occurred before the attack began, his emotions, actions, and interactions with others. While asking her questions, she did not notice anything unusual or noteworthy. However, she continued the interrogation to ensure she didn't miss anything important. When she thought she had exhausted the subject, she gently insisted that he describe the episode itself. As she expected, he was reluctant to do so, but she explained that the details of his experience might be helpful to Dr. Adenauer in making a diagnosis. As Gina listened to him recount his experience, she found it difficult to maintain her professional composure. Most of the mentally ill she encountered did not realize that anything unusual was happening to them, the voices they heard or the impulses they felt were natural to them. But Ben's experience was different, he seemed to be fully aware of how abnormal his behavior was. Gina could easily see how frightened he was that his mind was failing. What bothered him most was the distorted perception. I remember seeing a woman screaming, but instead of hearing her voice, I felt a strong, bad taste in my mouth. At another point, I ran my hand across the carpet and saw blue color. It was the most scary and disturbing experience of my life. What you are experiencing is called synesthesia, Gina explained. Essentially, your senses are confused, and your brain has misinterpreted the sensations. Synesthesia is often observed, but it is not clear exactly what is happening. Ben was still disturbed by his memories of the experience, but he was somewhat reassured by the fact that it had a name. It was clear that Ben didn't want to go too far into his episode, and Gina didn't want to risk provoking another one, so she suggested they have lunch early. As the two of them ate tasteless food off paper plates, she racked her brain, trying to find a safe topic to discuss with him. Shifting thoughts, she remembered Dr. Adenauer's comment about Ben's memory. Perhaps this was the approach she should have taken. Plus, maybe it would help her gain Ben's trust. Okay. Gina said cheerfully as they finished lunch. Let's change the subject. This afternoon will be all about Ben Mitchell. I want to know everything about you. I think you're going to have a boring time, Ben replied. Let me be the judge of that, she replied. Well, let's begin with that. She began a tour of Ben's life, asking him questions about everything he could remember, his relationship with his parents, his likes and dislikes, his emotions and preferences, basically everything that might shed light on or reveal the antecedents of his sudden psychosis. Before starting, Gina was afraid that they might quickly run out of topics to discuss, but once they began, time flew by, each event bringing up new questions and memories. Gina wasn't as interested in the actual events of Ben's life, she looked for subtext, any clues that might reveal the mind of the patient before her. But it was impossible to listen to his story and not be drawn into it. Gradually, she began to draw conclusions about the person and not just about the patient. Before Gina started working with Ben, she had certain stereotypes about businessmen in general and bankers in particular, but it quickly became clear that this one did not live up to her expectations. For example, he did not come from a privileged family, his father was a middle manager, and she soon learned that Ben's mother was drinking away any extra money they might have. Listening to Ben talk about his mother, she quickly understood why he avoided alcohol so carefully, even if he had some genetic predisposition to alcoholism. Gina decided that the spectacle of his mother's degradation had left such an indelible mark that he would never give in to temptation. But beyond the life lessons he learned, Gina also noticed the impact of her mother's illness on Ben. It would be easier if she died suddenly, she thought. Yet rather than withdrawing or becoming bitter, Ben's response was to become even closer to his father. Gina decided that this showed a significant level of resilience, which she appreciated. 
Ben was just about to talk about Elizabeth when they were interrupted by the nurse on the 4 o'clock to midnight shift. Sorry to interrupt you, Gina, but if you don't stop, we won't be able to do the shift review and handover. Gina was stunned and promised Ben that they would start tomorrow morning as she hurried away. Later, as she picked up her car from the hospital parking lot and headed home, she shook her head. I need to manage my time better, she thought sadly. I have a lot of notes to type when I get home. The next morning, Gina brought another Starbucks cup for Ben, and he gratefully acknowledged her thoughtfulness. It seemed to her that he was glad to see not only the gift but also her presence, and this encouraged her. Despite how much time she spent with Ben discussing his early life, Gina found many more issues she wanted to explore. As she looked through her notes, it was only after dinner that they returned to the topic of Elizabeth. Gina knew that Ben had been married previously but did not know any details about their relationship or why it ended. Despite her professional reserves, Ben's story touched her more than she expected. So when Ed came to take Ben to his session with Dr. Adenauer, she almost breathed a sigh of relief. As soon as he left, she blew her nose and dried her eyes, cursing herself for becoming emotionally involved in the fate of one of her patients. The next morning, after Ben had enjoyed his coffee, he asked her an unexpected question, what do you think of Dr. Adenauer? Well, he's a famous psychiatrist and has been very successful, she said, not wanting to express her personal feelings about his aloof manner and dictatorial approach to the hospital staff. Why do you ask? It just seems like he was being formal with me, Ben complained. He seemed distracted and continued to ask me questions that we had already discussed. Besides, I don't see how Freudian analysis can help in a case like mine. I'm not a doctor, much less a psychiatrist, so I can't judge Dr. Adenauer's methods, Gina answered evasively. But he's very well respected, and I'm sure he knows what he's doing. Ben nodded and took another sip of his coffee, but it was obvious he wasn't convinced by her answer. Then he struck her with another unexpected statement. Before we continue talking about me, I want to know something about you. You've asked all the questions so far, so it's only fair to give me a turn. No, that's inappropriate. You're the patient, and I'm the nurse. You're the one being treated, not me. He visibly winced at her last words and Gina immediately felt guilty. There was an awkward pause, but he recovered faster than she did. I'm just not used to such attention. Besides, I would really like to know something about you. After all, you're practically my only companion for quite a long time. She again wanted to refuse him, but then thought about it. Maybe, she thought, asterisk I could learn something from the questions he asks, from the things he's interested in. Besides, I don't know what I'm doing anyway, so why not, asterisk. She ended up spending most of the day telling Ben her story. At first, his questions were the kind that might be asked of a new acquaintance, but soon he began to show a deeper interest in her thoughts and motives, asking questions not only about facts but also about feelings. Damn, she thought, he's better at this than I am. He was particularly interested in her relationship with her ex-boyfriend and was outraged to learn how the man abandoned her when she became pregnant. While describing this episode, Gina felt how long suppressed emotions were rising to the surface. It's not like I was trying to get pregnant, she exclaimed angrily. We used contraception. That's what happened. But he accused me of trying to trap him, and then he just disappeared. Have you thought about abortion or adoption? asked Ben. No way, Gina answered sharply. Angela's father may have been a rat, but my daughter is the best thing that ever happened in my life. It wasn't easy raising her alone, but I wouldn't change a thing, she said decisively. I wish my mother felt the same way about me, Ben said thoughtfully. At that moment, a noise was heard outside the door of the room, and when Gina looked back, she saw one of the most amazing women she had ever seen entering the room. Sila! Ben exclaimed, jumping to his feet. The woman's face immediately showed confusion, and Gina instantly understood what was happening. She grabbed Ben's arm and pulled it. Sit down, Ben, she said hurriedly. You'll scare her. Understanding dawned on Ben's face, and he reluctantly sat back down. Seeing his calm actions, the woman entered the room. Ben, darling! I'm so glad to see you, she exclaimed. Gina thought it sounded disingenuous, but she realized that people could react this way to mental illness. 
Ben beamed at the sight of his wife. It's so good to see you, honey. I missed you so much. Sila smiled and then quickly glanced at Gina. Who is this woman? She asked. Gina turned to her. I am Esposito's nurse, Mrs. Mitchell. Dr. Adenauer has assigned me to work with your husband to restore him. Ben's wife gave her a reserved nod and then added, I see. Well, I guess we won't need your presence at the moment. Gina didn't allow herself to be scared. A hospital staff member is required to be with the patient on this floor at all times, she said firmly. You should have been told this at the counter. It's okay, Ben quickly intervened. She's my friend. She helps me a lot. I see, Sela repeated, apparently deciding not to make a scene. She turned back to Ben. Honey, I'm so sorry I couldn't visit you sooner. I knew you were in good hands, and after your, uh, accident at the banquet, everything was in such a state of turmoil anyway. I worked a lot with Perry to keep everything going at the bank. It was really crazy there, as you can imagine. Gina flinched at her choice of words, but Sela continued. Anyway, Dr. Adenauer has kept me informed of your condition, and I am very glad he says you are making excellent progress. Gina saw the skepticism in Ben's eyes when Dr. Adenauer was mentioned but knew better than to say anything. As they talked, it was clear that Ben was happy to see Sela, but Gina also sensed the hint of disappointment. I'm glad to know that you and Perry are keeping things going at the bank, he told her. That's really comforting. Hopefully, I can get back to work soon. He paused, then added, it's a pity you couldn't come sooner. I know, honey, and I'm so sorry. But here, I brought you a little gift to make it up to you. With these words, she picked up the brown bag she had brought with her and handed it to her husband. When Ben opened it, he found a Starbucks cup and two packets of sugar. I know how much you must have missed your favorite coffee, so I brought you some. With that, she stood up to peck him on the cheek, and before he could react, she quickly moved away. Sorry, I have to run, darling, but it was wonderful to see you, and I'll be back as soon as I can. With that, Sela turned around and ran out the door, leaving Ben with a cup of coffee and sugar in his hands and a puzzled expression on his face. Before the moment could get awkward, Gina quickly spoke. Oh, it's so nice of her to bring your favorite coffee. She must love you very much. Ben nodded and smiled slightly, but Gina noticed how he looked at the empty Starbucks cup she had brought him that morning. Still trying to cheer him up, she added, Your wife is stunningly beautiful. I can see why you married her. Thanks, Ben muttered and sat down to drink his coffee. It was obvious that he was upset by his wife's hasty departure. At that moment, a nurse from the evening shift poked her head in the door, informing Gina that it was time to change shifts. Gina patted Ben's arm and said as cheerfully as possible, See you in the morning. Enjoy your coffee. As she drove home that evening, Gina was seething with anger. What a, she thought. If Ben were my husband, I'd be banging on the hospital doors every day to get to him, and she ran away in five minutes. Gina was so indignant that she told everything to her mother and brother Marco, who came to them for dinner. What's wrong with this woman? She was indignant. Marco immediately started making fun of his sister, claiming that she was too attached to her patient. When he started singing a tease about lovers kissing on a tree, Gina couldn't stand it. You should listen to yourself for once, Marco. You sound like you're back in high school. You don't know a single detail about the situation. This guy went through a terrible experience, and his wife treated him like trash. Anyone would be outraged by that, so keep your opinions to yourself. Marco knew his sister well enough not to make things worse, but he couldn't help the grin on his face. Gina rolled her eyes and tried to ignore him for the rest of the evening. I won't get too close to my patient, she told herself firmly. After he left, however, the next morning, she went to work earlier than usual. After purchasing a Starbucks cup for Ben from a kiosk in the hospital lobby, she hurried to the floor. But before she went in, the night nurse stopped her. You better not go in there, she warned. He had another attack last night, and this time it was serious. Oh my god. Gina cried and rushed to look through the viewing window. Ben was tied up in a straitjacket and leaned against the corner of the room. Holding back her emotions, she returned to the night nurse. Tell me what happened, 
she said, trying to remain calm. Apparently, the attack began immediately after the change of duty personnel, the nurse answered. The night nurse heard him scream and noticed that he was sweating a lot. Then he began to become delirious and rushed around the room. The nurse said that it seemed as if he were going blind, he kept running into the walls and falling. He would hide in a corner and sit there as if in fear, and then suddenly he would get up again and begin to feel the walls like a blind man. Thankfully, Harold wasn't gone yet, and he and Ed were able to calm him down and put him in a straitjacket. We gave him a high dose of diazepam, and that calmed him down, but this morning he started crying again. Gina was deeply shocked by what had happened but tried not to show it. She returned to the viewing window and looked closely at Ben. He seemed awake but completely depressed. Gina opened the door and walked up to Ben. Sitting down next to him, she began to loosen the straitjacket. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Another nurse asked worriedly. He was pretty wild last night. I'm sure, Gina said, although she wasn't really sure what to expect. But she acted decisively until she finally freed him from the heavy material. She then sat down next to him and put her arm around his shoulders. He looked at her with frightened eyes. Oh, Gina, I don't know what's happening to me, he whispered in a hoarse voice. He then lowered his head into her lap and began to cry like a child. Most of Gina's patients did not realize they were sick, on the contrary, they insisted that everything was fine with them and that the rest were crazy. This was the first time she had encountered a patient who seemed to fully understand that something was wrong with his mind, and this realization shook him to the core. Seeing him in this state touched Gina more than any other patient, and she herself could not hold back her tears. She stayed with him for a long time until another nurse entered the room. When Gina raised her eyebrows, asking what was going on, the nurse held up a syringe. Clopine, she said. It's Dr. Adenauer's order. Gina nodded. Clopine was the atypical antipsychotic and the pill of choice in such cases. After Ben's second episode, it became clear that he needed a pill therapy. Ben, she said quietly, the nurse is about to give you an injection that should help. He raised his head for a moment, then nodded indifferently. It broke her heart that all his energy was gone. After administering the medicine, Ben quickly fell asleep. Gina quietly left the room, then stood in the hallway trying to regain her composure. She was deeply upset that Ben had had a second attack. He seemed so normal, so well-behaved, that she had dared to hope that what happened at the banquet was a one-time event. Then she remembered Sela's words about Ben's progress, which Dr. Adenauer had supposedly noted. I would like to hear what Adenauer has to say now, she thought angrily. She walked over to the computer terminal and quickly brought up Ben's records so she could take a look for herself. What she saw shocked her. Dr. Adenauer wrote, the patient appears to be suffering from an acute transient psychotic disorder. Under this entry, she found a second one from the previous night, which changed the diagnosis to persistent delusional disorder with chronic primary hallucinatory psychosis. She had to look up the term in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and when she found it, she was overcome with anxiety. According to recent studies, even the most modern pharmacological pills could not completely eliminate psychotic delusions but only weaken them. Adenauer must have been feeding Sela Mitchell false promises to keep her from worrying. Gina decided, however, that this was not her responsibility. This thought made her check the call logs, and she found no evidence that anyone had called Ben's wife with an update. This was also not part of her duties, but Gina still decided to call. She felt that Ben needed something to cheer him up, and it was obvious that he wanted to see his wife. Perhaps she will come if she finds out what happened. Hoping it wouldn't come back to haunt her, Gina picked up the phone and dialed the number listed in Ben's emergency contacts. When her call was answered, she immediately recognized the woman's deep voice. Mrs. Mitchell, this is Nurse Esposito from the hospital. I don't want to scare you, but last night your husband had his second major psychotic episode. I thought you should know about it. Oh, how terrible, exclaimed the voice. How is he now? We had to sedate him overnight, Mrs. Mitchell, but he woke up this morning and seemed to be feeling relatively fine. Dr. Adenauer gave him extra medication, and he's asleep now. I'd guess he'll wake up around noon if you'd like to come and visit him. Unfortunately, I won't be able to come to the hospital today, but as soon as my work permits, I will definitely come, 
Sila said coldly. Gina tried not to explode in anger at the woman's attitude. Mrs. Mitchell, I really think it would be helpful for your husband if he could see you as soon as possible, she said. Now the voice became icy. I'll come as soon as my work permits. Thanks for calling. With these words, she hung up. Gina stood there seething with anger. What kind of wife is this, she thought furiously. She was still angry when she got home that evening, and after dinner, she called her brother Marco, who did not come to dinner with them this time. Hey Marco, I want to ask you a favor. I want you to do a background check on Mrs. Benjamin Mitchell. She introduces herself as Sila. Hey, 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 sis, I can't just test someone without a good reason, Marco countered. Well, I have a good reason, Gina responded heatedly, and she described her two encounters with her patient's wife. She may be a cold, but that doesn't mean I can just test her, Marco said. When Gina finished, Marco said, Look, I know you checked on your ex and no one found out. Just do the same for her and let me know what you find. You'll get me into trouble one day, Gina, but I'll see what I can do. Gina had heard nothing new from her brother by the time she returned to work two days later. She checked the list of patients and, not surprised, found that no one had come to see Ben during this time. When she came to him, he was calm but lethargic. My brain feels like it's full of molasses, he complained. All my thoughts seem to be slowed down. She nodded reassuringly. This is a known side effect of clopine, she told him. It usually goes away quickly after you stop taking the medicine. When will this be, he asked hopefully. Gina realized that she had made a mistake but tried to hide it. Dr. Adenauer will decide that, she said. She expected him to be indignant, but he seemed to have lost interest. It doesn't matter anyway, he said grimly. I don't want to think. If I keep going crazy. The last thing Gina wanted right now was for Ben to become depressed. In desperation, she tried to think of some neutral topic that might interest him. Suddenly, an idea came to her mind. Tell me about banking, she said sharply. I know you got into this because your father was a banker, but there must be something else that keeps you in this field. He looked at her suspiciously. Why are you suddenly interested in this? It's not that I'm particularly interested in banking. I just want to understand why you're so interested in it. He shrugged and began to tell a story about a Christmas trip with his father many years ago. At first, he simply recounted the event and conversation in a neutral tone, but as he continued, Gina noticed passion awakening in him. She asked him clarifying questions and heard a note of enthusiasm when he continued. Gina was delighted. Not only was he emerging from depression, but his speech and thoughts seemed to become increasingly sharper. To her surprise, she herself began to get carried away by his story. Who would have thought that such a boring profession could have such a big impact on people's lives? Their conversation continued through lunch and throughout the day. Gina was about to ask Ben a question when there was noise at the door. Sela Mitchell entered, accompanied by a man in a business suit. Gina had already formed her opinion of Ben's wife and was no more impressed with her companion. The man was about the same age as Ben but overweight and with thinning hair. Who is he and why is Sela Mitchell with him, she thought. Ben stood up as if he wanted to run to Sela, but perhaps remembering Gina's warning, he restrained himself. Darling, how glad I am to see you, he exclaimed. He then turned to the man next to her. Perry, thanks for coming. How are you? He asked the man enthusiastically about the bank, but Sela interrupted him. We can discuss this later, dear, she said. Now there is something we need to discuss with you. As you can imagine, the CFB has a backlog of cases requiring enforcement decisions. We put it off for as long as we could, hoping you could return to CEO duties, but now with the latest complication, it looks like that won't happen anytime soon. Gina wasn't sure where this conversation was going, but one look at Ben's face was enough to tell her that he didn't like it. Perry continued the topic. That's right, Ben. We have a lot of things to do. We need to file reports with the Securities and Exchange Commission, sign contracts, and deal with the proposal from Bank GRS, which we have not yet considered. Wait a minute, Ben interrupted. We've already decided that we'll reject Bank GRS's offer. Of course, of course, Perry continued quickly. 
but we haven't made it official yet, and they're waiting to hear back from the CEO. What Perry is trying to say, Sila chimed in, is that the bank was starting to sink without the CEO at the helm. So he took over the role until you get better. To make sure our interests are protected, he asked me to serve as executive vice president. Ben was stunned. But how could he do this? I am the CEO and largest shareholder. You can't just suspend me. Of course not, dear. Nobody is going to remove you. We just received power of attorney from Judge Gray to manage your affairs until you get better. It was the only way for everything to continue to run smoothly while you were here, you know, fighting the disease. Have you declared me incompetent? Ben asked in disbelief. Trust me, this was the only way, dear, Sila said smoothly. Besides, this is only until you recover. Then everything will return to normal. To Gina, it was as if all the air had been let out of Ben. He seemed to shrink and leaned against the wall behind him, bowing his head. If this is the only way, I understand. It's just not easy to accept, you know. Gina wanted to go to him and console him in his obvious distress, but out of the corner of her eye, she noticed the second shift nurse giving her a signal. Reluctantly, she said, Ben, I have to go. I'll see you in the morning. Okay, of course, he said blankly. Perry spoke up. I think it's time for us to go too, Sila. We don't want to interfere with the work of the hospital. As Gina finished her notes for the shift, she watched them leave, talking to each other in quiet voices. She ground her teeth in anger. Even if what they did was necessary, there must have been a better way to present it, she thought. When she finished, she walked toward the stairs leading to the parking lot. As she walked through the shadows, she suddenly heard arguing voices and froze in place. The hospital was in a safe area, and she had never had any problems, but Gina knew that a woman who was alone should always be especially careful. Not here, she heard the woman whisper and immediately recognized Sila's voice. Intrigued, Gina cautiously moved closer, trying to see what was happening. Come on, Sila. It's over now. Ben's out, and we're in control. There's no need to hide anymore. Oh damn, that's Perry Burgeon's voice. Gina thought. What the hell is going on? Perry, it won't help us if anyone finds out before this is over. If you'll just restrain yourself long enough to get home now, I'll show you why patience is a virtue. Gina didn't hear the man's answer because the engine of his car suddenly started running. Then, while she was hiding behind a column, the car rushed along the ramp toward the street. Oh my god, Gina thought as she headed home. Asterisk Sela and Perry are having an affair. This, you can expect anything from her, asterisk. She found her brother helping their mother prepare dinner, and Gina pounced on him. Quickly tell me, have you found out anything about Sela Mitchell? Marco looked sly. You know, Gina, I really looked into Sela Mitchell, and I have you to thank for that. Why? What did you find out? His sly look gave way to a wide smile. I found out she's the hottest, most beautiful woman I've seen in a long time. He chuckled. It was definitely a pleasure checking her out. Gina was not happy. Idiot, she shouted angrily. I want to know what she's really like. I think she's having an affair with Ben's partner, and they're up to no good. Marco's smile turned into a knowing look. Well, it would fit her image. What do you mean? Gina demanded. Based on the information received, she was indeed married to a guy in Miami just like she told Ben. And here's a coincidence, he was also a banker. But she didn't leave him because he was cruel, in fact, it was he who kicked her out when he caught her with her lover. He also punched her in the face, which broke her nose. She sued him for this. Right, Gina wanted to know. I'm afraid our girl was quite naive in those days. She didn't know that her husband was a banker for some pretty tough guys in the import business, if you know what I mean. Apparently, some of these guys visited her and explained that if she wanted to keep the rest of her face intact, she had better take her husband's offer and get out of town. They apparently explained it clearly because, according to my friends from the Miami police, the next day she was on a plane. I guess she used her compensation to get into Wharton. Gina said, remembering what Ben had said, her flight from Miami may have stopped at Philadelphia International Airport, 
but that was the only thing that brought her closer to UPenn. She attended Florida Atlantic University for a couple of years, and that was the end of her formal education. That, Gina growled. She was leading Ben by the nose this whole time. I can't wait to tell him what she's up to. Now take your time, sister, Marco said, lying a couple of times to look better in front of a potential husband. It's not a crime. If that were the case, we'd have to arrest half of Match.com's users. As for treason, what evidence do you have? Yes, what you heard in the parking lot sounds suspicious, but there could be another explanation. Besides, your patient is already clinging to sanity with all his might. Are you sure you want to loosen his grip? You need to take it slow, girl. Gina took a deep breath. I guess you're right, she said reluctantly, but I'll be watching this woman like a hawk. I didn't like her at first sight, and everything you told me makes her even more suspicious. Marco smiled slightly at her. You're just jealous that she found Ben before you. I'm not jealous. He's just a good man who needs help, and he's definitely not getting it from his wife. Of course, Gina, of course, he said, still grinning. The next morning, Gina still didn't know what to say to Ben. The conversation she overheard was certainly provocative, but she had to admit that it was not straightforward. And Ben is so vulnerable now, she thought. As soon as the shift handover ended, her mobile phone rang. Pulling it out of her pocket, she saw that her brother was calling. I'm warning you, Marco, I don't want to hear any more of your jokes this morning. This is not a joke, Gina. We've just been informed that Perry Baran was found dead at his home from a suspected heart attack. I thought you should know about it. Oh my god, Marco. This is terrible. I guess I should tell Ben, but it would be very hard for him. Perry was his best friend. But still, I don't want him to find out about it any other way. Damn, damn, damn. When she entered the soft room, Ben was sitting quietly on the floor. He looked up, saw her, and a brief smile flashed across his face, but then he sank back into apathy. These are all medications, Gina thought, hating their effect. She came and sat down next to him, taking his hand in hers. Ben, I have bad news for you. When she finished, he began to making sounds. I can't believe Perry died. He was here in this room just yesterday. Why? 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 He groaned again, and Gina noticed that he was sweating profusely. She looked worriedly at his face and saw that his eyes were unfocused. No, he suddenly shouted. Stop it! Then he began to ramble incoherently, his face contorted with fear. The charge nurse must have heard him because her voice came over the intercom. Is everything okay, Gina? Should I call Ed? Not yet. Gina shouted back almost pleadingly. Let me stay with him a little longer. Maybe it will help. Okay, Gina, but don't take any chances, said an impersonal voice. Ben writhed on the soft floor. Gina moved closer to him. It's okay, Ben. I'm here. Nobody will touch you. He continued to make unintelligible sounds, but Gina thought they were less agitated than a moment ago. She reached out and began to stroke his back. He flinched but did not try to move away. Encouraged, she continued to pet him, purring soothing words to him. He moved blindly, his head poking at her thigh. He stood up and then laid his head on her lap. She held his head with her left hand and stroked his back with her right, singing to him like a mother comforting a frightened child. Gina was so focused on trying to calm him down that she lost track of time. Eventually, she realized that he had fallen asleep. Carefully, she pulled herself out from under him and placed a foam pillow under his head. Then she quietly walked to the door and left, locking it behind her. Are you okay? The nurse on duty asked her, alarmed. Didn't he offend you? No, why did you think that? The woman silently pointed to her face. Gina hurried to the ladies' room and looked in the mirror. Only then did she realize that her makeup was smeared from tears. She watched Ben for several hours, but he continued to sleep. Finally, late in the evening, he began to move, and when Gina noticed this, she hurried back inside. Ben raised his head, still sleepy, and looked at her blankly. Then something clicked, and a look of despair appeared on his face. 
It happened again, didn't it? We were talking, and suddenly everything started going crazy. I saw your face melt, and there was a strange taste in my mouth. I tried to warn you, but only colors came out of my mouth. He looked at her helplessly. I'm really crazy, huh? Gina squeezed his hand to emphasize the importance of what she wanted to say. Ben, can't you see? This time everything was different. Yes, you had one more episode, but it didn't last long, and you came out of it on your own. We didn't have to calm you down or tie you down. I don't know what's going on clinically, but I have to believe it's a sign of improvement. It didn't seem like an improvement to me, Ben said bitterly. My brain has stopped working again. I wanted it to work the same way as before. Then he fell silent, as if pondering what had happened. But it wasn't as scary as last time, and I wasn't as scared. It was still scary, but somehow I felt like I could get through it. Gina didn't say anything, but she had a happy feeling inside. This episode was much milder than the previous two, and the fact that he was able to come out of it on his own seemed very encouraging to her. And to be honest with herself, she was glad that she could help him cope. Sela couldn't do this, an inner voice whispered to her, but she brushed the thought aside. When her shift ended, Gina stayed later to review Ben's notes again. She was amazed that his recent episode was so different, but she couldn't find an explanation for it. She reread his entire file, hoping to find at least some clue. She checked his blood tests especially carefully, hoping to find some imbalance or deficiency that might provide an explanation. Finding nothing unusual, she eventually gave up and left. When she returned home that evening, she was surprised to see Marco waiting for her. What happened, big brother? Did the diner stop feeding the cops? She asked with a smile. This time, however, Marco was in no mood for jokes. I came because I wanted to hear what happened to your patient today. Gina's smile disappeared as she told him about the patient's latest episode. But I helped him, Marco. I was able to calm him down, and he came out of this state much faster than the last two times. I think that's a good sign. Marco looked at her intently. Nurse, I know I'm not a doctor, but I have to tell you that your patient is taking something forbidden. Listen, it all adds up, the sudden onset, the wild hallucinations. He's clearly had some bad trips. But they're not all the same, Gina countered. His episode today was very different from the previous two. Did you tell him about Baran? asked Marco. Yes, Gina answered reluctantly. Well, here's the answer, he had a flashback caused by stress. This is a fairly common occurrence. Marco. I'm telling you, he doesn't accept anything. He was given all sorts of tests when he had his first episode, nothing was found. Okay, what type of testing was done on him, he asked. Urine tests, of course. This is what the federal government requires. Nothing was found. Marco nodded. And how soon after he went crazy was this test done? Gina remembered trying to recreate the notes she had recently reviewed. Well, his first episode started around 9 o'clock on Saturday night. He was kept in a padded room until Sunday, when he was taken to the main hospital for testing. Then they took all kinds of pictures. If I remember correctly, the blood and urine tests weren't done until after he was returned to Longview, so it could be 24 hours or more. Right, Marco said knowingly. So what? A urine test can detect pills even days after they've been taken, Gina replied. But not this kind, Marco said. This stuff can leave the urinary system in just a couple of hours. How long after his second episode did they wait to run tests again? They didn't do them again, there was no need. He was in the hospital. Everything he consumed came from there. He couldn't get any pills. Are you absolutely sure he didn't get anything from outside the hospital? Only Sela Mitchell. She also brought him a glass of coffee from Starbucks. But if someone mixed something in his coffee, half the hospital would lose their temper. At Sela's name, Marco became wary. Does he put anything in his coffee? Sugar? Cream? One of those fancy additives? Only sugar, she replied. Here's the answer, he said confidently. It came in sugar packets. Then we have to do something, she said anxiously. Quiet! Take your time. All of this is just your and my guesses about what could have happened. 
On the other hand, we have a reputable psychiatrist who says that I am completely wrong about what happened to Ben. Even if his wife really manipulated her husband into continuing the affair with his partner, how will you prove it? That guy is now just a corpse in the morgue. For now, all you can do is continue to observe. Gina shook her head. I guess you're right, but I don't like it at all. Marco gave her a stern look. Only one thing, little sister, be careful in this madhouse. Do you know what I mean? She nodded, dissatisfied. The next day, coming to work, Gina again found herself in a difficult position. What to say to Ben? She felt it would be a mistake to raise her suspicions for fear of upsetting him again. She had already seen what the news of Perry Baran's death had done to him, and she didn't want to cause another episode. She also didn't want to ask questions. As far as she knew, Ben had no doubts about his wife. For Gina, filing charges could be a risky move that could alienate him. In the end, she decided that their conversation should be calm and as normal as possible. However, her brother's words left her feeling anxious and unable to relax. Two days later, something happened that really increased her paranoia. In the middle of the day, the nurse on duty stopped Gina and told her that she should take Ben to Dr. Adar's office on the sixth floor. This order was so unprecedented that Gina asked the nurse to repeat it. Neither of them could remember a patient ever being sent to the sixth floor, and this raised alarm bells in Gina. To buy time, Gina asked the nurse to prepare Ben's wheelchair while she went to the ladies' room to get cleaned up. As soon as she entered the restroom, she grabbed her mobile phone and called her brother Marco. There's something going on here that's really worrying me, she said. You must come here immediately. As she explained the strange order, her brother spoke with doubt in his voice. What's strange about this? She tried to explain how this was out of line with normal practice and how it bothered her. Patients never go to the sixth floor. Ever. I don't know what's going on, but after everything that happened, I feel very uncomfortable, Marco. Something is clearly wrong here. Please, Marco, please. She could almost picture him shaking his head. Gina, I can't just barge into the doctor's office and demand an explanation. This trick could cost me my job, and besides, I have a lot of work to do here. Sorry, sister, but I just can't leave. I'm scared, Marco, she said, but he had already hung up. She put the phone back in her pocket and looked at her face in the mirror. Come on, Gina, it probably doesn't mean anything. Besides, no matter what happens, you have to be strong for Ben. You don't want to scare him into another attack. When she came out, she was somewhat successful in overcoming her anxiety. The charge nurse had already found a wheelchair, so Gina took it and opened the soft room door. She then came in to explain their excursion to Ben as best she could. He was curious about the visit to Dr. Adenauer's office but was puzzled by the sight of the wheelchair. It's hospital policy, Ben, Gina reassured him. That way you can't fall and sue Longview for negligence. We don't want anything to happen to you. Ben reluctantly agreed. When the elevator stopped on the sixth floor, Gina rolled him out. This was her first visit to the administration floor, and she looked around with interest. Unlike the other floors where she worked, this one had thick carpet that made it quite difficult to push a wheelchair across. They're definitely not expecting patients here, she thought with alarm. As they neared the end of the corridor, she was struck by the sight of Ed opening the double doors to Dr. Adenauer's office. Ed, what are you doing here? She asked nervously. She always felt uncomfortable under the gaze of the big orderly. I'm here to make sure there won't be any disturbances here, he said with a smirk, stepping aside to let her through. At first, Gina didn't see anyone, but then she noticed Dr. Adenauer talking to Celia Mitchell on what appeared to be a large balcony. Come in, come in, Ben. Adenauer said joyfully. I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Bring him here, nurse, so we can all sit here and enjoy the afternoon sun. At Adenauer's signal, Gina rolled Ben onto the marble floor towards the balcony. As Ben stood up, his wife came over and gave him a quick hug. To Gina, it didn't seem like a gesture of affection, but she kept her opinion to herself. Ben, Sela, and Dr. Adenauer sat down at a small table on the balcony, while Ed stood next to the entrance, leaving Gina standing undecided. This is a celebration of sorts, the doctor said solemnly. 
so I think we should serve drinks. No alcohol for me, Ben said quickly. No, no, of course not, said Adenauer. I know your preferences, Ben. We have coffee for you and tea for Sila and me. He turned to Gina. Everything is in the kitchen, bring it for us, nurse. Gina was outraged that she was being treated like a waitress. They had already tried to use her like this more than once, and she had quickly put everyone in their place. But in these circumstances, she restrained herself and went in the direction indicated by the doctor. Walking into the small kitchen, she was confused by what was happening. I wonder what they're celebrating, she thought. It all seemed strange. Looking around, she noticed cups and saucers arranged on a silver tray. A kettle of hot water sat on the stove, and next to it stood an expensive coffee maker with a full jug of fresh coffee. As she poured water into the cups with tea bags and coffee into the remaining cup, she noticed that sugar packets were already on each saucer. She was about to take the tray to the balcony when a terrible thought struck her. What if sugar had been mixed in? The thought terrified her, but before she could think of anything else, Dr. Adenauer called out to her impatiently. After Gina put the tray on the table, Sela quickly reached out and placed the cups and saucers in their places. Dr. Adenauer nodded approvingly and then looked at Gina. Thank you, nurse. That's all. You can return to your post. Leaving Ben alone with these people was the last thing Gina wanted to do. Shouldn't I stay to help Ben? She asked desperately. Adenauer's expression became hard, and in an authoritative voice, he said, We will take good care of your patient. Now go and close the door behind you. Gina turned and reluctantly walked towards the door, desperately trying to think of what she could do to help Ben. Without thinking of anything, she left, closing the doors tightly behind her. Ben watched what was happening and clearly began to get nervous. I don't understand, Dr. Adenauer. Why am I here? What's happening? We'll explain everything in a minute, Sela suggested. But first, let's enjoy our drinks in this beautiful autumn sun. As the three drank their beverages, Adenauer took the opportunity to describe his vision for Longview Hospital and brag about some of its accomplishments. When he finished, he looked at Ben curiously. This is all impressive, Dr. Adenauer, but I don't see how it concerns Sela and me. Sela and the doctor exchanged a quick glance before Adenauer turned to Ben again. The fact is that there are always challenges to any great vision, and there are always those who are unable or unwilling to see the opportunities. For example, in the case of Longview. What Dr. Adenauer is trying to say, Sela interrupted, is that he is a much better psychiatrist than a manager. Adenauer looked at her with indignation, but she continued, I am afraid that the doctor's great plans have run into financial difficulties. The hospital is experiencing short-term but extremely serious cash flow problems. Moreover, other lending institutions refuse to provide the hospital with loans that could support its solvency. In short, if someone doesn't give it a serious loan soon, his hospital will go under. I think this is an exaggeration of the situation, Adenauer said but Sela did not pay attention to him. Community First Bank could meet the hospital's needs, but of course they don't make those loans, Ben continued. He shook his head vigorously. That's right, we serve completely different clients. We never issue such loans. That's true, Sela said, unless there is a change in leadership at CFB that brings in a new philosophy. But this could only happen if the previous management was somehow incapacitated, forcing a replacement. What are you saying, Sela? Ben asked in shock. Sela, I don't like this conversation, Adenauer said. Sela ignored both of them and looked at Ben. Once Dr. Adenauer helped me find you incompetent, it was easy to manipulate poor L.E.L. Perry Burgeon into doing what I wanted. Unfortunately, Perry lost his patience and didn't want to listen to reason, so I had to get rid of him. Sela, we didn't agree on this, Adenauer said anxiously. I don't like all this. Before he could say anything else, Ben jumped to his feet. Oh my God, Sela. I can't believe it. Did you do this to me? Did you kill Perry? Who are you? She smiled coldly and harshly at him. I am a woman who knows what she wants and how to get it. And now I want Bank Group to acquire CFB and make me very rich. Unfortunately, 
Our negotiations have encountered an obstacle. Bank Group is concerned that the power of attorney I have may be revoked and the deal may fall through. To resolve this issue, Dr. Adenauer and I must make sure that you never regain your abilities. Ben felt cold sweat appear on his forehead as he realized the meaning of Sela's words. What are you planning now? He asked anxiously. I'm afraid you're going to have another episode, Ben. And this time it's going to be severe. In your delirium, you will jump from the balcony and fall to your death. You can't do this. Ben screamed in horror. Actually, I already did, she replied calmly. The sugar and the coffee you just drank have been mixed with a pill, and the effect will begin any minute. Look at you. You've already started to sweat like a pig. Soon you will be completely helpless, and then our great friend Ed will help you try to learn to fly. Ben felt Ed's heavy hands pressing down on his shoulders, pushing him back into his chair. No! Let me go! Ben shouted and began to struggle, screaming with all his might. At the same time, he felt another attack begin. Suddenly, the office door swung open and Gina ran in. What are you doing with him? She exclaimed. Let him go! Adnauer was horrified by Gina's sudden appearance, but Sela remained calm. Well, well, isn't this touching? Our little nurse is trying to save her patient. I wondered if you had lost your professional distance from my husband, and now I see that I was right. She heard everything. Adnauer shouted. Hi, C. What should we do now? Actually, I think it's for the best, Sela replied calmly. It will be a great story. A caring nurse tries to save her patient, but in the end, she dies along with him. All those detailed records you kept will document how devoted you were to him, as well as how he became a psychopath. We will make a martyr out of you, my dear. At that moment, Adnauer let out a loud, inarticulate scream, causing everyone in the room to turn and look at him. No! No! Leave me alone! Stop it! He shouted. His arms began to flail as if he was trying to fight someone off, and his head turned sharply left and right as if he were trying to escape from something invisible. Don't touch me, he shouted in horror. Then, while the others looked on in amazement, the doctor suddenly jumped to his feet, climbed over the railing, and fell screaming from the balcony. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't know it would happen like this, Gina said plaintively. The others turned to her in amazement. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want Ben to use that sugar, so I replaced it with Dr. Adenauer's sugar, she admitted. Ben began to groan, feeling the onset of a flashback, and then sank limply into his chair. Ed growled at Gina, pulled a knife from his pocket, and walked toward the terrified nurse. Seeing him approach, she screamed, don't you dare touch her. A voice shouted behind her, and Marco ran into the room, gun at the ready. The big man saw him and turned to attack his new opponent. Marco fired, but the bullet seemed to have no effect. He shot again, and then a third time. Then he took a step back, tripped over the wheelchair, and fell to the floor. He made the sound once and then fell silent. Sela was the first to come to her senses and quickly began to move toward the door. But Gina noticed this and grabbed her hand. You're not leaving. Realizing that there was no way out, Sela straightened up and tidied her clothes. Officer, I want you to arrest this woman, she said, pointing at Gina. You heard her admit that she mixed the pill with poor Dr. Adenauer. It's a lie, Gina exclaimed. She tried to pin it on Ben, and this man, she said, pointing to Ed's body, tried to kill me. Nonsense, Sela quickly replied. Ed was a hospital employee who tried to protect Dr. Adenauer from what he believed to be an attack. And this man over there, who is clearly mentally unstable, is my husband, who was treated by Dr. Adenauer. Gina calmly crossed her arms and looked coldly at the woman she had come to hate. Oh, is that so? She asked. We'll find out now. With these words, she rushed to the kitchen and returned a moment later with a mobile phone. I left this here when you tried to send me away and it recorded everything that was said here. I wonder what the court will think about this. Sela, the attractive woman, stood silently, staring angrily at her opponent while Marco walked toward her to handcuff her. Gina rushed toward Ben, who was still sitting with his head down in the chair. 
Walking up to him, she gently took his hand. Ben, what happened? She asked quietly. He raised his head and looked at her in bewilderment. What's happened? He asked weakly. It seems that stress triggered another flashback for you, Gina replied softly. Recognition flashed in Ben's eyes, and he straightened up. Oh God, I remember. Sela killed Perry, and she was going to kill me. She was the one who mixed something into my drink. He stared at Gina, expecting to see shock on her face, but instead, he saw a joyful smile, and his own expression reflected bewilderment. Ben, listen to yourself, she said with emotion. You overcame the flashback. You were only in this state for a few minutes, and now you are fine again. You really are getting better. With these words, she hugged him, and he responded with happy relief. When Gina returned home from work two weeks later, she was happy to see her older brother there. She hugged him tightly. My hero, she said. Enough, enough, he replied, although it was obvious that he liked her continued gratitude. It will never be enough, she said with feeling. If you hadn't come on time, I might already be a red blur in the hospital parking lot. He shuddered and became serious. I heard you, you know. On the phone, I heard you say that you were afraid, and I immediately returned. I couldn't leave my little sister. She hugged him again, tears of gratitude in her eyes. After dinner, Gina suggested that her daughter go play in her room because she wanted to get the latest news on the case from her brother, but she didn't want her five-year-old daughter to hear the conversation. As soon as Angela left, Marco told Gina and his mother the latest news. He informed them that Sila had been indicted by a grand jury, but she had hired a famous lawyer and pleaded not guilty. How can she do this? Gina was indignant. I have a recording of her detailing the entire conspiracy in Dr. Adenauer's office. There's no way she can dispute that. Marco shrugged. Her lawyer is trying to argue that this was all a privileged conversation between doctor and patient. I've never heard of such things being privileged, but even if they are, we have plenty of other evidence against her, and we continue to collect it. I don't think she'll be able to escape punishment. Marco shook his head with an ironic smile. You know, I could almost feel sorry for Sila if she weren't a psychopath. She was a real intriguer, but every one of her intrigues encountered obstacles. She married Ben thinking he would be her ticket to luxury, but she became disillusioned when Ben turned down Bank GRS's takeover offer. So, Sila decided to have Ben declared insane with the help of Dr. Adenauer, and she seduced Perry Baran to convince him to agree to Bank Group's offer once Ben was eliminated. So, Baran was aware of the whole plot? Asked Gina. Everything except killing Ben, Marco replied. Baran's wife told us that he was always jealous of Ben, and all the public praise for him only increased this envy. In any case, when Sila started flirting with him, Baran was in her arms. He thought she loved him, so he went along with her scheme to eliminate Ben. So, after Sila got Ben declared insane, Baran became CEO. What went wrong? Apparently, Baran became greedy. He had both the title of Ben and his wife, and he did not want to wait to show it to everyone. This became a big problem for Sila because she knew that people would start asking questions if their relationship became known. So, she decided to get rid of Baran and become CEO herself, thinking she could do whatever she wanted with the bank. Wait, I thought you said Baran's death was ruled a heart attack, Gina countered. Marco didn't give up. Not surprisingly, the initial autopsy revealed nothing suspicious. Baran was eventually found lying on the floor, fully clothed, with no visible wounds. When the medical examiner opened him up, his heart showed clear signs of a myocardial infarction, so the case was closed. But now the DA has a court order to exhume Baran's body, and this time they're going to take a deep dive into what they find in his system. There are many pills that can cause a heart attack. I heard the medical examiner suggest it was digitalis. Baran was already in bad shape, so it's not surprising that this was fatal for him. So she put poison in the sugar packet? Gina wanted to know. Marco shook his head. That's how we think it happened. Baran took her to his house the night you overheard their conversation in the parking lot. His wife was out of town, so when they arrived, they had an intimate. He probably fell asleep after that, which gave her the opportunity to administer the lethal injection. 
By the time he felt the needle, it was too late. Once it was finished, she was able to clean up and leave. Pretty cold-blooded, isn't it? Gina shuddered. At this moment, their mother, who had been listening to the conversation all this time, spoke up. I still don't understand. Who did Sila have an affair with? Perry Baran or Dr. Adenauer? I bet both, Gina quickly responded. This woman is willing to do anything to get what she wants, so another lover wouldn't be a problem for her. Marco shrugged. She may have had an affair with Adenauer, but she refuses to answer any questions. Adenauer is dead, so we don't know for sure. But even if she wasn't having an affair, she still had powerful leverage over him. Adenauer desperately needed money to keep his hospital afloat. Sila found out and offered him a loan in exchange for his help in getting Ben declared mentally ill. Then, when Baran became a problem, we think Adenauer helped her with him too. After we finish checking the hospital records, I'm sure we'll find that Adenauer was the one who supplied her, Marco added. He continued, just when she thought she had everything under control, Bank Group pulled out of the CFB acquisition due to uncertainty about Ben's condition. It was then that Sila decided that Ben needed to be removed for good. By that time, Adenauer was already so deeply involved that he had no choice but to go through with it. Marco looked at his mother and sister with an ironic expression. Sila's plan was like cancer. It continued to grow and spread until it got out of control. And even with all this, she could have pulled it off if it weren't for Gina. Gina blushed and shook her head in denial. It's not like that, mommy. Marco figured out what was going on and showed up just in time to save the day. Their mother hugged both children warmly. All I know is that I'm very proud of you both, she said proudly. At that moment, their celebration was interrupted by the doorbell. Esposito's mom went to see who had arrived and returned a moment later, followed by Ben Mitchell. Out of the corner of his eye, Marco saw Gina smile widely when she saw who it was. I hope I'm not intruding, Ben said awkwardly, but this is really the first chance I've had to come and thank you. He was holding a large box of pastries in his hands. Gina, I don't know how to express my gratitude to you for everything you've done for me, but I decided to at least start with these flowers. They are beautiful. Gina accepted them happily. Thank you. Ben turned to Marco with a smile. I also owe you a lot, but I didn't bring flowers. I'm glad for that, Marco replied, and the others laughed. At that moment, Gina's daughter came down the stairs. Angela, who had been playing in her room, came to see what the noise was. Gina called her over and pointed at Ben. Say hello to Mr. Mitchell, baby. This is the man I told you about. Seriously? Angela extended her hand to Ben, who dropped to one knee to shake it. Are you the one my mother loves so much? She asked innocently. Gina gasped, blushing with embarrassment. Ben smiled widely. I hope so, Angela. The girl looked at him appraisingly. Do you love my mother? She asked. Gina was about to intervene, but Ben raised his hand to stop her. It's okay, he said. He then turned back to Angela with a serious face but a twinkle in his eye. You know what? I'm crazy about her. What do you think of our second part of our story? In my opinion, this whole story had quite an unusual plot and interesting things to say. What is your impression from listening to both parts? Write in the comments. Until new videos.